Hi, I'm Talina Winters. Um, you probably found this on my page, so you know that already. Sorry, I haven't done very many of these live videos, and so uh, bear with me if I stumble a bit, but I just wanted to spend some time uh, today talking about my upcoming book and another book that I've already released actually, but it's a prequel to the upcoming book, and I'm gonna be doing a reading from that. So my upcoming book is called The Undine's Tear. It's probably backwards for you. Um, this is the first book in a young adult science fantasy trilogy um, that's geared for more like age 14 and up. Um, kind of like the same audience as Hunger Games or Divergent, that kind of an audience. Um, I'm super excited to be releasing this because um, it is my, well, I guess my fourth book to be published now, but this is the story that made me want to become a fiction author and so i'm really really excited to see it go out into the world and um i've been working on it for a long time if you think about how how much i had to go through just to get to this point um so and one of the things i've noticed as i've been leading up to the release date which is next tuesday by the way i forgot to say that i should check my notes um anyways Leading up to the release date, which is next Tuesday, May 14, uh, this will be available to the world. But uh, of course, it's been out with ARC readers, um, advanced readers, and, and beta readers and stuff. And a lot of people don't actually know how to say Undine. And that is how you say it. Undine or Undine is not Undine. It's like Marine, okay? So it's Undine. Uh, it's the Undine's tier. And uh, the other thing people are like, what is an Undine? Well... And undine is actually, um, it comes from the Greek, and it's actually an elemental water creature. So um, uh, in my book, because I have a whole race of undines, um, I decided to call them something more gender, or sorry, less gender specific than mermaid. They are essentially a mermaid race where they are, they are half fish and half human, but they're also a shape-shifting uh, mermaid race so they're also they have a human form but in, anyways I just thought it was too uh, human like to call them mermaids I, I have I have males in there as well so undines is what they are <laughs> um, okay so as I was writing the undines tier um, I, it's got it's got a couple of point of views in there and one of the points of view is from a young boy named Zale and I love Zale he is one of my favorite characters I don't know if I'm allowed to pick favorites but he's definitely one of my favorites and while I was setting up his story because he's like the secondary main protagonist there's two main protagonists and he's one of them and um, I came up with this really cool idea for his backstory and I would even written a bunch of it out and um, and then I realized that it wasn't like I needed to know that backstory, but that material wasn't appropriate to put in the Undine's tier. It, it set up the wrong story problem and um, it just made it, it, it was too, it, it didn't work. However, um, I've been wanting to find a way to kind of uh, thank my my newsletter subscribers and my and my loyal readers um, and, and kind of give them a, give people a taste of, of my writing. And so I decided what I would do is I would turn that into a novella, which I did. And it's called The Water Boy. This is printed off because it's only available on ebook and is not this big. <laughs> Actually, um, as I said, it's a novella. It's about a little bit shorter than this book, my first book, The Friday Night Date Dress. So if you're wanting to sit and read The Water Boy, it'll take you, mm, well, depending on your reading speed. I'm an average speed reader and it takes me about four hours to go through it. Um, so yeah, The Water Boy is about Zale, and today I'm going to be reading the first chapter from The Water Boy. It is free to anyone who wants to get it, um, for my newsletter subscribers. And so if you want to get The Water Boy t today, you can just go to my, uh, contact page at www.talinawinters.com slash contact, and you can find that, uh, my main website there just in my, on my page link. Um sorry in in my on my author page and then go to the contact page from there so if you sign up for my newsletter you get that automatically it's a free gift 
and then um, uh, you can, I mean, you can unsubscribe right after if you want, but you get that download right away. I'd like for you to stick around if you, if you decide to, because, you know, about once a month we talk about cool stuff, books, you know, fun things. Um, anyway, so yeah, that is... I think that's all I want to talk about. Oh, one more thing before I start reading. Um, so I do have, along with the, the launch for the Undines tier, I have a couple of book tour weekends coming up. Um, some events in, in book, local bookstores in Alberta. And so this upcoming weekend, I'm actually having a pre-release launch party right in my hometown um, for, my, for my local fans which is going to be fun. I came up with a fun game with my husband last night. We're going to play, um, and it's this Saturday at three at the Peace River Municipal Library. Please come, please bring your young adults, <laughs> which would be your teenagers. Um, I, you know, this book isn't, uh, isn't just for girls. <laughs> That's why I also stayed away from the word mermaid is because this is a, a book that, that boys and girls would enjoy. And so, um, yeah, please come on out. The following weekend, I'm heading down to <clears throat> Central and Southern Alberta, and I will be doing another launch party, actually, at the Sylvan Lake Library, Friday after this one, excuse me. <clears throat> so that will be at the Sylvan Lake Library on fr next Friday, May 17, at 4. So if you're in that area, please come out to that. I also have a reading in Calgary on Thursday and a signing at Red Deer Chapters on Friday. Saturday and then on Sunday I will be in Edmonton and I forget which store I think it's the South em Indigo South Edmonton Common but you can find that in my events page so yeah please check that out and if you're around and you have time come on out I'll be doing another book tour hitting uh, both uh, hitting like Edmonton uh, Red Deer I think no just Edmonton and Calgary um, in the third weekend of June as well so check that out and I hope to see you come out and grab a copy of the book or just come out and chat for a while. Okay, so um, let's get to the reading. This is chapter one of The Water Boy. And please excuse my pronunciation for anyone who's actually from England, from Cornwall. I can't do accents very well. I can write them okay, but I can't actually say them very well. And I don't know how some of these things are pronounced. I just find, I, you know, when I just read them, I don't always know how they're said, but I will do my best. <laughs> Here we go. So this is in Madron, Cornwall, England, autumn, 1793. Zale Teague was 10 years old the day he killed his father. That afternoon, he had been playing in Lord Alberton's apple orchard with some other village children only a mile from the stannery where his father worked. The branches were heavy with fruit, and Robbie Cox, the youngest of the squire's three sons, had said that they were expecting the gypsies to show up any day for picking. Robbie was 14 and was always saying he was too old to be playing with Zale and the others, but he kept inviting them, them to come over anyway. Zale thought that Robbie's older brothers must be terribly poor sports. As supper time drew nigh, Zale decided to surprise his father and walk him home from work. Talwyn Penrose, the pretty, dark-haired girl with the unusual eyes, well, unusual golden eyes, offered to walk home with him since her father also worked at the mine and they were neighbors. He shrugged nonchalantly. Suit yourself, I guess. As he turned away, he smiled. He liked Talwyn, but it wouldn't do for her to know that. Not when it had been weeks since she'd worn the red ribbon he, get, he gave her. He said goodbye to Robbie and little Johnny Prouse, one of the constable's passel of children, and they headed off through the trees. It had been a rare hot day, not a cloud to be seen. Zale thought his father would be thirsty and tired, so he wanted to bring him a treat. He knew better than to take any apples from the trees overhead, but as he was leaving the orchard, he spied, spied a small one on the ground. It was a little bruised, and he knew the gypsies would pass over it, so he stooped to pick it up as a gift for his father. Griffin Cox, Robbie's older brother, happened to be passing by on the road, accompanied by his gang, the lanky Willie Prouse, Johnny's oldest brother, and barrel-chested Jory Davis, the blacksmith's son. 
Griffin had inherited his mother's dark good looks, but his father's peevish temper, more's the pity, and despite the company he kept, he took every opportunity to remind the local children that his station was far above theirs. He saw Zale scoop up the apple. Hey, you there, freak, drop that at once. Zale stood tall and squared his shoulders. He was used to Griffin calling him names. His unusual luminescent green eyes seemed to unnerve the older boy. I didn't do nothing wrong, sir. This apple was on the ground and no good to nobody. Griffin strode over and snatched the fruit from Zale's hand. That's not for you to decide, you presumptuous little whelp. Talwyn puffed out her chest. Griffin Cox, some day you're going to be sorry for being such a selfish, arrogant prig. I should have guessed that the two crazy-eyed weirdos would stick together. Griffin sneered at her. You are speaking to the son of the squire. You should show more respect. Talwyn crossed her arms. Respect must be earned. Now give him back the apple and we'll be on our way. Griffin laughed. And what are you going to do about it, little mouse? Talwyn made a growling sound deep in her throat that was surprisingly resonant. Willie Prouse and Jory Davis flanked Talwyn and Zale on either side, wicked grins on their faces. Talwyn glared up at them, her nostrils flaring, but clamped her mouth shut. This wasn't the first time Zale had had a run-in with Griffin or his friends. Zale knew that if he didn't put a stop to this, it could only end one way. But as much as he'd like to knock the cocky blaggard's block off, there was no sense getting Talwyn in trouble too. Don't worry about it, Talwyn. Let's go. He can have this stupid apple. Talwyn gave him a small smile and nodded, turning to go. Griffin snickered. He examined the apple and sneered, then threw it on the ground and stomped on it with his boot. It wasn't worth eating anyway. Anger flared red and hot in Zale's stomach. He clenched his fists. Willie and Jory broke out laughing and Griffin twisted to bask in their approval. When the older boy turned back to gloat over his victory, his face was greeted by Zale's fist. Talwyn whirled. No! Talwyn shouted at the two boys to stop their nonsense while Zale scrapped at the boy twice his size and a good seven years his senior. There was no contest. When Griffin's father, James Cox, Baron of Alverton, came upon them a few minutes later, Griffin had pinned a bruised and bleeding Zale to the ground, but not before he'd received a black eye by Zale's hand. Lord Alverton sided with his son, dragging Zale to his father at the stannery and demanding that penance be made for the stolen apple in Griffin's eye. Zale's father was a kind, even-tempered man who had always taught his son to be respectful of authority. That day was the first time Zale ever saw his father lose his temper. Papa thought Lord Alverton was blowing the situation out of proportion. The squire disagreed. Zale watched helplessly as Papa argued with Lord Alverton, urging the squire to see reason. It was merely a bruised apple, and boys would be boys, and Griffin was hardly blameless, blameless in the situation after all. But Lord Alverton threatened the tin miner with being dragged before the judge and possible time in the stocks for his contempt of the Baron's position. He even went so far as to send Willie to retrieve Mr. Prowse to make good on his threat. Zale couldn't stand it. His father couldn't be punished for Zale's crime. He tried to jump in and tell them that, to get them to listen, but they were too busy yelling at each other and had nearly come to blows themselves by that point. Then something happened that Zale didn't understand. Seemingly out of nowhere, a storm gathered. The wind blew so hard that bits of leaves and debris flew past them. Lightning flashed above their heads what seemed only a few paces above the mine stack. The arguing men and the gathered crowd abandoned their confrontation to seek shelter. Zale looked around, wondering why the storm that raged around him seemed like a mere echo of the storm that raged within. Those in the yard fled toward the engine house beyond, including Zale's father, Talwyn, and her father, Mr. Penrose. Zale stood there, frozen by fear. Papa turned around and saw Zale standing in the storm. Come, he said, waving his hand at Zale from the lee of a shed near the tall brick engine house. 
Griffin, who had been running while staring at the flashing lightning in the sky, bowled right into Zale's father, knocking him to the ground. Watch yourself, paper skull, Griffin snarled. He stumbled to his feet and ran on. Zale couldn't contain his anger any longer, not with his father picking himself out of the mud, obviously in pain. He ran forward, yelling at Griffin at the top of his lungs. Then a bolt of lightning hit the shed and the world ended. The shed had contained the explosives that were used to blast out the mine, and Zale's father had been standing right beside it. Zale couldn't remember much else of what happened that day. But by the end of it, his father's lifeless form had been taken away, laying on a wagon board, and Lord Alverton had forbidden Zale to come near his family ever again. The next day, Talwyn and her mother, along with the portly minister, Reverend Berrien, brought over fresh honey cakes. The aroma of the warm bread teased Zale's nose, but he wasn't hungry. The adults spoke quietly in the Teague's small clapboard house. Talwyn followed, <laughs> Talwyn followed Zale to his thinking tree and sat beside him on the grass beneath it. He stared at the gray skies and heathered fields, wishing he could turn back time. But as much as he might wish it otherwise, he knew that his whole life had changed. His papa had been his world. What would he ever do without him? So that is chapter one of The Water Boy. Um, and thank you, Anne. I appreciate you saying that, that you love my voice. Um, so yeah, you can get the whole book for free if you sign up for my newsletter on my website, www talinawinters.com um, and then go to the contact page and you can get the whole book it's fun it's a pretty fun little read and uh, I've had a few uh, reviews on Goodreads so far and there almost everybody says it's just too short so I know it's supposed to be short it's supposed to just whet your appetite but it, if if you get to the end you're like no that's not really my cup of tea you won't feel like this the story's unresolved it's it's enough on its own you won't be like oh i have to like read the next book or or no um but anyway so that's that thank you so much for those of you who joined me today um on the facebook live and if you're reading watching this later feel free leave a comment ask a question i I'm on social media several times a day and so I do check these things out and I notice and reply. So yeah, and also I hope to see you next week and be sure to go pick up a copy of The Undine's Tear. You can go even and pre-order it right now on Amazon and Chapters and um, Kobo, Kindle, whatever. You can go a lot of places and get it already. So yeah. I should maybe tell you what, what the book is about since I'm here. Sorry. Um, okay, so just in brief, uh, the the tagline of this book is she was raised to save her people as long as she doesn't go crazy and kill them for all first. And I'll just read the back and then I'll be done for today unless there's some questions. Okay, Calandra is the most powerful Undine healer to be born on Serenia for three millennia. She has been raised to be the savior of her people, the only one with a hope of healing the heart stone that hides their civilization from the human race. However, she has questions. Why must her kind capture human males to survive? Why do all the powerful healers go mad? And why does her aunt, Queen Adonia, seem determined to hide the truth about her people's history? Across the sea in England, Zale is unaware of his merman identity until a series of accidents leaves his father dead and his friend blinded. Fearing his own elemental powers, he flees from his home and becomes a spectacle on display for money. When the beautiful and mysterious Abela frees him and tells him that he is the last male of his kind, he finds himself on a quest to save his mother and the sister he's never met from the same dark forces that pursue him. But if he can't control his powers, he may destroy everything he's trying to save. Meanwhile, the heartstone is failing and along with it, the protective barrier it powers. To save the stone and her people, Calandra must choose between enslaving the man she loves or trusting a cryptic, seditious mes message left behind by the mother who abandoned her as a baby. And the madness is calling. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me and for watching and for supporting my work. I appreciate it so much. 
Um, I will probably be doing a reading from the Undines tier next week um, on release day. So check back in. I've made an event on Facebook uh, for the release day and I'll probably do it in there. So anyways, thanks so much. Have a great day.